each other um, very often, so that's a pro. What's a con? Um, I, <laughs> it's a pro. Uh, April said the same thing. Uh, it, you know, it, you always worry that you know, there's, there's resentment like, how, how come you got on Conan, and how come you got on Howard Stern, or what I want that? It, it, comics are so needy and insecure, and they're always just, they're always bitching about other people's success. So, so hopefully that doesn't happen too much in our relationship, but that's what I'm scared of. And that's what, I, I actually knew one other set of comedians who were talking about, they were married. And it was the same thing. One one career started moving a little faster than the other, and both on shows. Be happy with what you have, but we're comics, and we can't do that. No. And April was voted, if I if I remember correctly. Yeah. Uh, stand up comedian. Yeah, uh, uh, and and it came down to April. I think she's the hottest. So it's the hottest. Stern yeah, Stern. So yeah, it's not exactly. beautiful. Yeah, it wasn't like the most beautiful flower in the whole. That's right. It was Howard Stern. It was hot ass or something like that. Good. And Gilbert was there, uh, as a matter of fact. And, and it came down to April and uh, the the uh, Whitney uh, um, Cummings, yeah. who has the television show. But April won. Yeah. April won. And uh, so, so here, so here you are. You, you're living uh, uh, in. You told me Malibu now, yeah. right? With the most beautiful stand-up comic, the hottest yeah. ass okay. stand-up comic uh, on uh, earth. Well, yeah. according to Howard Stern, I, I need to, you to remind me of that when I like. I, I, can you just? I'm going to take this podcast and just play it when I wake up in the morning to get me going. Like, oh, yeah. Well, my question is, how the hell did that happen? How, how did that happen? Uh, I don't know. It was, uh, I got very lucky, I suppose. Um, we were on a uh, Bob and Tom tour together for for a few months, and, and for a couple weeks of it, we were on a bus, and it was uh, close quarters, and, and uh, you know, she didn't have a whole lot of options. So, <laughs> there I was. But, All right. I add alcohol to the mix. I remember uh, when I was uh, when I was in college, I, I got into the theater department, and that was a, I found the same thing there was that I got in the theater department, and and the ratio of it's funny when uh, like I look back in high school and everyone was like. Theater kids, they're all gays. Like, uh, not all of them. Some of them are just genius. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. exactly. Now, you did, you went to college? Uh, no, not really. Not like, really. I think I think I took. I mean, I always wanted to do, to be a stand up, and I I kind of out, out of high. I wanted to go right out of high school, and then I was like, oh, I better save up some money first, and then I spent all my money on booze for five years. Until I was like, well, I better just go whether I have money or not, because my life wasn't going anywhere. And uh, and so yeah, it's, I think like toward um, toward the end of that, I was like, oh, maybe I should have a backup plan. So I went to college for uh, for a semester. I I worked third shift at Ashley Furniture Factory, and uh, and I worked like 50 or 60 hours a week, and then I was taking like 19 credits of college. So I did this uh, crazy. Thing it is, I I didn't get it from Seinfeld, but it's it's a reference more people would know that the thing where uh, the episode where Kramer sleeps like for 15 minutes every four hours, uh, it's called Wolf Sleep. It's a I slept every four hours for like 15 minutes, and it was bizarre, and uh, and sometimes I would hallucinate. <laughs> And uh, it wasn't healthy. And then one day, um, but it was crazy because like I'd, I'd go to a class on a Monday, and then I'd have a test on it on a Friday, and I just it was all the months just ran together. So it's like I just heard it, so I just I wouldn't have to study or anything. I just ate the test. But um, but then uh, one day, uh, my uh, oh, I wasn't expecting to talk about this. Um, <laughs> One day, my I was at work and um, and my my butt started dripping. Um, my butt 
Your started what? Started dripping. Your butt started yeah. dripping. Yeah, my butt started dripping. And um, I was taking all these weird vitamins and stuff, like trying to stay alive. Which, of course, and now we know, we know that, that from a lot of products, back then you didn't know about anal leakage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. now it's like a common knowledge yeah. thing, anal leakage. Yeah. I know all about it. You I had it way it. before it was even popular. Yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah, I was really hip with my <laughs> anal leakage. And so, like, I went to, uh, yeah, I went to the bathroom and checked it out, and it wasn't normal. It was no, it no, was uh, it nothing. was bizarre. It's all I'll say. And uh, and so then I dropped out of college. I was like, that's not worth it. That is not, not worth it. it. But and, but you uh, figured. <laughs> I like how you you were working at Ashley Furniture Company and going to college and developed anal leakage, yeah. and you went. It has to be the university. <laughs> <laughs> it couldn't possibly be the job that's doing this. This is the Ashley Furniture job. Yeah, I'm kind of uh, I'm kind of glad. I mean, every, I don't. It's not advice that I would give to youngsters, but it, <laughs> it it sure helped me out not having a backup plan because I was very driven because I didn't really have any other career options. I had no martial skills. And then, so is that is that when you transitioned in? So then I moved to Boston. Yeah. And um, and then I was I was there for uh, a few years, and I I was doing. I think when we met, um, I had been unemployed for like six months or something like that. Uh -huh. um, I got laid off of this company that went under, and so I collected unemployment from them for like a year, uh, like a mooch. And, uh, but I used it, so then I just went and I did every spot I could, and I wrote comedy all day long. And, it, and it, uh, really, I had a year to really grow as a comedian. And, that's, and, and so you caught me, and that was... Um, that was right before. Uh, so I did this Boston Comedy Festival, and then these HBO people uh, heard about me from that, and then they invited me to this festival that no longer exists because I did it, and they're like, oh, screw this. Shane Moss is getting in this thing. Um, but and, 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 I, and, and, you know, it's something that, you know, there's a lot of, and we had some open micers here tonight, and there's a lot of guys that, that it, you know, ten, five years, ten years to get their self to where they've got you know, maybe 40 minutes of material and get in. And, and, and so many of them don't even get a nod. And you had 20 minutes or so of material, you told me when you were at the Boston Comedy Festival about. And it was the perfect 20 minutes for that festival. Yeah, it just it's was. just like five to seven minute spots. So, and, and when you're starting out, that's all the spots that you're getting. So it's a lot of short jokes and, and it's like jokes that are perfect for television. And now, now that I do longer sets, I'm doing more stories and things like that because I have to fill time. Uh, and uh, you know, be up here for 40 minutes to an hour or whatever it is. And because um, you got the Conan re relatively quickly. Yeah. So I won this award in the festival, and then the Conan people um, w happened to be there when I won this award. And then um, so there's like a few different late night places that wanted to have me first because at the time I, I was like this uh, big up and comer that just won all these awards. Oh, yeah, what happened to that? And now, um, <laughs> but uh, and so then I, I got on Conan right away, and it was uh, it was I very fortunate. Um, I, I I still worked. I had this fantastic job um, where I was working. I was a temp construction worker, like I said in my act, and uh, I was at this place, and I I was there for a few months, and there were these security guards around. They were just never doing anything, and I got to be friends with a couple of them. I'm like. Can I have your job? Uh, and he's like, sure. Like the boss guy was like, sure. You can be a security guy. And so the job was see these big, these huge construction companies. They just need to have security for insurance liability purposes. It's not like really to protect anything. So they just, they'll just get like the cheapest people that they can because it actually saves them money on insurance costs. So this is the least legitimate company I've ever worked for in my life. I, they didn't give me a uniform or anything. They were like, show up, sit in your car, don't talk to anyone, and don't get caught sleeping. They didn't say don't sleep. They said don't get caught <laughs> sleeping. And how long did you work for the federal government? <laughs> and so I, I worked with them. It was great because I just go and I got to make my own hours and everything. And I just go with my computer and I just write jokes all day long. 
and I, you know, I got paid 10 bucks an hour or whatever. And then the night I was on Conan, um, some kids snuck into this property and turned on all the gas in these huge apartment buildings and blew them up. It blew up these buildings, and um, and there's like a cop. A furniture job. Yeah, I'm kind of uh, I'm kind of glad. I mean, every I don't. It's not advice that I would give to youngsters, but <laughs> it, it it sure helped me out not having a backup plan because I was very driven, because I didn't really have any other career options. I had no marketable skills. And then, so is that is that when you transitioned into? So then comedy? I moved to Boston. Yeah. And um, and then I was I was there for. Uh, a few years, and I, I was doing, I think when we met, um, I had been unemployed for like six months or something like that. Uh -huh. um, I got laid off of this company that went under, and so I collected unemployment from them for like a year, uh, like a mooch. And, uh, but I used it, so then I just went and I did every spot I could, and I wrote comedy all day long, and it, and it uh, really, I had a year to really grow as a comedian, and that's, and, and so you caught me, and that was, um, that was right before. Uh, so I did this Boston Comedy Festival, and then these HBO people uh, heard about me from that, and then they invited me to this festival that no longer exists because I did it, and they're like, oh, screw this. So sh <laughs> Shane Moss is getting in this thing. Um, but and, 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 I, and, and, you know, it's something that, uh, you know, there's a lot of, and we had some open micers here tonight, and there's a lot of guys that, that it, you know, ten, five years, ten years to get their self to where they've got, you know, maybe 40 minutes of material and get in. And, and, and so many of them don't even get a nod. And you had 20 minutes or so of material, you told me when you were at the Boston Comedy Festival about. And it was the perfect 20 minutes for that festival. Yeah, because it it's was. just like five to seven minute spots. So, and, and when you're starting out, that's all the spots that you're getting. So it's a lot of short jokes and it's, and it's like jokes that are perfect for television. And now, now that I do longer sets, I'm doing more stories and things like that because I have to fill time uh, and uh, you know be up here for 40 minutes to an hour or whatever it is. And because um, you got to Conan re relatively quickly. Yeah, so I won this award in this festival, and then the Conan people um, w happened to be there when I won this award, and then. Um, so there's like a few different late night places that wanted to have me first because at the time I, I was like this uh, big up and comer that just won all these awards. Oh shit! What happened to that? And now, um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, and so then I, I got on Conan right away and it was uh, it was I did Conan um, about my um, or just under uh, it's just before my third year of doing stand up so it took me three years which is uh, extremely fast and I was very fortunate. Um, I, I, I still worked, I had this fantastic job um, where I was working, I was a temp construction worker, like I said in my act, and uh, I was at this place and I, I was there for a few months and there were these security guards around, they were just never doing anything. And I got to be friends with a couple of them, I'm like, can I have your job? Uh, and he was like, sure, like the boss guy was like, sure, you can be a security guy. And so. The job was, see these big, these huge construction companies, they just need to have security for insurance liability purposes. It's not like really to protect anything. So they ju they'll just get like the cheapest people that they can because it actually saves them money on insurance costs. So this was the least legitimate company I've ever worked for in my life. I, they didn't give me a uniform or anything. They are like, show up, sit in your car, don't talk to anyone and don't get caught sleeping. They didn't say don't sleep. They said don't get caught <laughs> sleeping. And how and long did you work for the federal government? <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I worked with them. It was great because I just go and I got to make my own hours and everything. And I just go with my computer and I just write jokes all day long. And I, you know, I got paid 10 bucks an hour or whatever. And then the night I was on Conan, um, some kids snuck into this property and turned on all the gas in these huge apartment buildings and blew them up. It blew up these buildings. And, um, and there's like a cop from down on the highway that saw it and he drives up and, uh, and, the, uh, and the security guard's just sleeping in his car with huge explosions <laughs> happening behind him. And, uh, and so then they looked into the company and found out that they weren't terribly legitimate and didn't have their proper licensing and everything. And so then that company went under and so then I didn't have a job, and that's when I became a full-time comedian. <laughs> <laughs>
and no anal leakage at that point. Correct. None whatsoever. Yeah. yeah, yeah your butt trips one time, and you really that's go to it. great lengths to make sure that it, that's not going to happen that again. That is it. Now, when you were when you were at this when you, when you were at this point where you're writing this you're writing the material and everything, were you visualizing your career, the your path, like setting goals and and making some sort of strategic way to get to each point? I'm gonna be on this show. I'm gonna get this special. Uh, was um, that the process, or like a little, a little bit? Like I remember when I was a kid, I wanted to be a stand-up since I was like ten years old. So I remember as a kid, uh, daydream in school about you know being interviewed by Letterman or whatever. Uh, you know, you'd have these little fantasies. But um, when I got into stand-up, um, I, I mean, I kind of, you know, in the beginning, I was like, I had. I, I was writing for years before I ever performed, and so, which is why I moved along a little quicker because I had more to draw from. But, um, but I, uh, I, you know, you have these ideas in your head. You're gonna walk out there, and uh, you know, just the whole time it's just gonna be a standing ovation, and then you go to some. Uh, I went to this open mic in Dorchester, Massachusetts, which is a really dangerous area I got mugged outside there one time but they do this open mic on a Wednesday and it was a real open mic where uh, 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 like um, like an old school open mic where if you show up you can go on so it would go for like four hours and if you and so like no one would pay attention and there's never an audience it's just other comics and but if you showed up and you performed you got a slice of pizza and uh, and so all these homeless guys would come in and do stand up <laughs> so so you have these illusions <laughs> in your head of like things are gonna be great, and then you go and you do an open mic, and there's like a homeless guy Food smoking line. crack in the back, <laughs> like oh, oh, I guess this isn't everything I dreamed about. <laughs> I, I, I'm not, I'm not a business-oriented kind of guy. I'm, I'm pretty laid back. I don't really worry about my career and. I just like, no, see what happens. I just sit and I write jokes every day, and then I get on stage and perform. I have a manager and an agent, and I, I delegate the uh, goals and planning to them. I, I don't, uh, I, I'm not a goal-oriented person other than I, I'm just like, I want, I want to create this much new material every month, and then... Now, you said that uh, earlier in your show, you talk about uh, binge drinking and blacking out. Yeah. Is that something you still enjoy? <laughs> um, enjoy? Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I drink too much. It's a little bit of a problem. Hey. Um, but, uh, I got it under control, everybody. I got it. I'm functional. All right, all right. I'm we'll functional. remember that. Yeah, I, uh, I, I so think that... It's hard. See, I get, um... I think I need a beer. I get free drinks. I feel, I'm feeling lonely up here. I'm up here with a freaking coffee cup. I get free drinks at, at clubs, and then and then on top <laughs> not of here, that, you know. Like, well, I get a couple. <laughs> I get a couple free drinks from your cheap ass. Um, <laughs> but at real comedy clubs, <laughs> I um, I get all <laughs> unlimited <laughs> amounts of booze forced down my throat constantly, and so. Uh, most of the time, it would start. If I drank, if I never drank hard alcohol, I would never have a problem. I've never once had a problem with just drinking beer or wine or whatever. But then sometimes I get doing the shots, and uh, then it's blackout time. It's always I, weird I, to me. Who here has never blacked out before? So there's like a lot of people. You just never blacked out. By applause. By applause. Who by, has never by blacked out? By applause. Out? Yeah, that's oh, amazing. Well, thank you, Pam. See, being from Wisconsin, I just thought it was the norm. <laughs> I was just uh, like when I because no, we I'm, have we have like a contingency here from Wisconsin yeah. where you're from, and they're they're supposed to be big big drinkers. Yeah, when I first moved to Boston, like I just thought I drank the way everyone in the world drank, and then I moved to Boston, and people were like, "What are you doing? Uh, you have a problem." I was like, "Oh, really? This is Listen, just what everybody does." When Boston people tell you you're drinking too yeah. much, yeah, it's an yeah. issue. Now, so I've been uh, reeling it in a little bit. You, uh, uh, I think, from watching you over the years, uh, you there's points of your show where I think you like to make the audience a little uncomfortable. 
Uh, sorry about that, guys. I mean, is that do you? Do you? Do, I mean, is that yeah, a little that like I don't want to turn people off, but I like feeling uncomfortable. Like I like that feeling <laughs> a lot. Um, really? Yeah, it's just like to do like it's so hard to like feel things, <laughs> you know, like. Uh, so often in a day, you just like you go to work and then you do these things. Like, unco feeling uncomfortable is like one of the most powerful feelings in the world. It's just like, oh. And so I like, uh, I've always liked um, the idea. What I did when I started out, um, my, my trick was I don't do this in a lot of my jokes now, but when I started out, what I did was I would say something to make the audience extremely uncomfortable. And then the punchline would be like a little explanation to like justify it, like, oh, okay, and that makes it okay. And what that is, is it's a release of tension. So I make you guys uncomfortable, and you're like, oh, and then I say something, and you're just like, ah, oh, and, then, and then people laugh a lot because it's a release, like, oh, I thought I was going to have to run out of the show. <laughs> and then you did a joke that was okay to say, uh, turns out, and so it's, it's a lot of, um, most joke structures are just about uh, building up an expectation and then breaking right. that expectation. And so that's just another way of, of doing that and emphasizing that. And the other thing that you talked about earlier in your show that I think is, uh, is uh, very much uh, the truth about comedy is the truth. Is that when you tell, I, I think we so seldom hear the unbridled absolute truth that it's kind of shocking to us when yeah. we do hear the truth. Uh, we, yeah, and uh, I'm not even one of those guys so much as, like, like a lot of my stuff is, I, I, I'm not like, oh, was I too real for you? Like, I'm, like most of my jokes are just about silly, dumb shit. I'm not, I'm not changing the world or anything. Um, but I just, I just like, uh, I like that idea of making people uncomfortable about something and then getting them back and that ease of tension uh, is kind of cathartic. But there are plenty of people like uh, Doug Stanhope, yes. where you watch him, it's like, even if you don't agree with him, he's this guy who's just been banned from every club in, in the country, but he has this amazing following that now goes to like music clubs and stuff to see him. Uh, he, was on, he, he was on the second version of The Man Show a while back. And, uh, but anyway, he's, he's like the best comic that there is. And 90% uh, of people just hate his guts. Uh, but he's saying things that are fantastic and like true and really hard to argue with his logic, even if you don't agree with it. Yes, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, one of the uh, one of the most brilliant comedy pieces we ever, Pam and I, my wife ever saw in Montreal during the comedy festival was Doug Stanhope, and there's a show that they do there late at night where they pick a group of comedians that are pretty well known, and you have to do a bit for 15 minutes that is true, that is the absolute truth about you. It cannot be something you've ever exposed to the public before, like your anal leakage thing. <laughs> yeah. And Doug opened the show, and his bit was about the fact that after two years of marriage with his first wife, she got pregnant, and they decided to have an abortion inside the marriage, you know. And as soon as he said it, I mean, you could, the whole crowd is like you guys. <laughs> oh, my God. Is this what we're going to have to listen to for 15 minutes? But he made it brilliantly funny, and yeah. you, you never would have thought because of the, the just the honesty behind it. Um, it's always amazing to me what it that's that's been part of the fun of um, of of my careers because I I understand that I don't I don't expect um, people uh, twice my age to necessarily um, relate to everything that I'm saying, but um, but sometimes. I used to have a very long bit, and it's actually, what I like doing, I like taking like shocking things that you're not supposed to talk about, and then bringing like an innocence and naivety to it, to like lighten it up and make it kind of cute and adorable, even though it's like this shitty, shocking topic that I'm talking about. So I used to uh, have this very long bit that, the only reason why I don't do it is because it's on my CD, and then I, you know, I dropped all that material afterwards, but it's about, uh, Try, attempting to have anal sex with my girlfriend, and it was like 10 minutes long. It's actually a cute story, believe it or not. Um, I know. Which you, they can I, purchase your CD yeah, right you, after you can, this. You can hear it. On the way home, you can all listen to the 10-minute anal sex story. And uh, what a teaser that is. But, to sell but it. one of, 
but the reason why I bring it up, one of my joys is, is I used to tell that, uh, you know, I get in front of crowds because you never know what to expect. And sometimes it'd be like, it, you know, just this party of, of like people with oxygen tanks and whatnot. And I'd be like, oh my God. You're really then, alienating then to see the like, Sarasota crowd. I know, you know I know, I'm aware. This is, a, this is the youngest audience I've ever seen in here, by the way. <laughs> um, <laughs> Cheers to you guys. Um, and but telling, talking about anal sex for ten minutes and seeing some ninety-year-old woman just buckled over laughing, I'm like, oh my god, I can't believe this. Like, that's my great grandma. It's great. And I know when, uh, uh, especially younger comics will come in because our crowds are older than than the average comedy club by ten or twenty years. And literally, and and they'll walk in the room, and and they'll they'll look at the they'll look at the audience, and and there'll be a hundred people in here on like a weekday night, and literally everyone has gray hair, everyone, and they're like, I got nothing for these people, and I said, the sex, the drugs, the rock and roll, those are the people that brought it in, yeah, you know, they're just yes, exactly, there's one right there, there's one right there, those are the guys that brought, it. and I remember the first time my grandmother came and saw one of our shows. And she came to a damn Friday late show, which I was like, oh my God, which is the rowdiest always. And it got rowdy and it got pretty bawdy. And after the show, I said, how, what'd you think? She goes, oh, I enjoyed it, it was really fun. I said, uh, I was a little worried about the language, you know, it was a lot of, a lot of F-bombs, you know, dropping. And she goes, honey, we've been doing it longer than you've been saying it. <laughs> you know. I, I don't have that good of an experience <laughs> with some of my relatives. Um, <laughs> I, uh, my, see, I, I didn't tell anyone that I moved out to Boston to do stand-up, and, and so I was just, one day I just called uh, my parents, I was just like, oh, I'm a stand-up comedian, and I'm going to be on Conan O'Brien next week, so you might want to tune in. And then they're like, Conan O'Brien? And I had never heard of him. And um, so anyway, so they're all excited, because they just found this out, and then, you know, they, so they have a relative that's going to be on TV and stuff, and, you know, everyone knows all extended family and everything, but they didn't know what my act was like at all. And, um, and I, I would say tonight was a bit tamer than, than uh, a, a lot of my stuff. Um, but um, uh, anyway, um, so they just had no idea. And, and the thing is, is it's one thing, like, like since I've had relatives come to shows and when you're in the showroom and the other people around you are laughing, and everything, and it's like, oh, okay, this is okay to laugh at, but like when you're watching something on TV, and it's like, oh, this is my grandson, or whatever, then you're thinking like, what are other people <laughs> going to think about this? So my grandparents, who, uh, uh, they lived in Lansing, Iowa, they went to this church for about 40 years or so. My grandma played the organ, and my, my grandpa sang in the choir, and being the, uh, the kind-hearted people that they are, not knowing at all what my act was like, uh, after after church, uh, they they <laughs> they handed out flyers <laughs> to all of their like 90-year-old church-going friends to watch me on Conan, and uh, and then you know I talk about vaginas, and they no longer go to that church. <laughs> <laughs> so hey. Uh, I'm real we'll, proud of myself. We'll we'll wrap up uh, if you want to bring the house lights over. We'll wrap up and uh, by letting you guys in the audience ask any questions if you would like, and if not, we'll we'll be on our merry way. But if you have a question, simply raise your hand and and uh, or, or blurt it out. Uh, any anything from, that anybody's curious about? Well, fuck you guys too then. <laughs> That's why it's going to be. All we right. have that a lot. They, they, they go, we well, don't Well, I wasn't know. interested in you we, guys either. We don't know what to ask. We don't know what to ask. <laughs> well, thanks, Shane. That was, this was great. And thank you all very much thanks, for guys. being Appreciate here. It. Oh, Come say what hi do we afterwards. have there? We have a drawing for a shot glass. Are you shitting me? Wow. There's Shane Moss, ladies and gentlemen. Shane. <laughs> Our third podcast. I love that. Did you enjoy that? Yeah. I enjoyed that.